I'm, I'm both honored and humbled to have been selected to give the Johnson & Johnson Lecture. Now, my declaration of interest or my conflict of interest is I have no conflict of interest, contrary to this patient's wife, who has a conflict of interest. And let's get started with a very short story about a kid who falls out of a mango tree. It's mango season in sub-Saharan Africa. For those of you that are orthopedic and trauma surgeon, you'll recognize the x-ray on the left-hand side as a displaced supracondylar fracture of the elbow. For any young orthopedic surgeon starting in practice, this is very anxiety-producing injury. They go to the emergency room at the local hospital. There's no treatment available. So they make their way to the main road by walking with no immobilization. Eventually, they find someone the minibus to take them to the city. They end up at the university hospital or the big city hospital in the emergency room on the fifth day. Now, if the kid's lucky, they'll get proper treatment. They'll get appropriate treatment and hopefully timely treatment. If the kid's unlucky, they may be looking at a lifetime of disability. But it really shouldn't be about luck. These two pictures are my first trip to Sub-Saharan Africa in 2015. Of all places, I ended up in a very small town called Ruyigi in Burundi. At that time, things were just picking up in terms of a little bit of political unrest in, in, uh, in uh, Burundi. That's the hospital on the left-hand side. And that's the group of people, the healthcare workers that we were teaching non-operative fracture management at the time. 2015, so five years ago, my first thought, I'm a neophyte with regards to care of the injured in LMICs, I'm saying, how can you imagine a kid falling out of a tree, having an injury to his elbow, and being left disabled for the rest of his life? In French, we say c'est impensable. In your language, you say it's unthinkable. I call it my nine lies, but in this case of this presentation, it's probably my credentials. Life zero was that of an orthopedic resident in Toronto. 1985 were the heydays of the AO Foundation. The concept was just being exported across the big pond. So my bosses were Joe Shasker, Marv Tile and Jim Kellum, all on the same service for two years. So my life was hell for basically five years. My professional life as an orthopedic surgeon was twofold. I worked with my father for about five years. We ran a mom and pop type of operation. JC, Jesus Christ, my father, and CJ, Claude Jr., the old guy and the young guy. Then I became what people would call the hand weenie I shifted into hand surgery. Then I became a trailing spouse, trying to do accommodate with my wife's work, who's in the audience. So a little bit of work in, uh, in Montreal with the Workers' Compensation Board, Israel, the UK pharmaceutical industry, repatriation back home to Ottawa, where I worked with a uh, medical malpractice company doing risk management. Then I moved to the dark side the side of management. And the last 10 years have been in Switzerland. The first five years being the AO Trauma Executive Director and now the AO Alliance Managing Director. That's my team. This is what we do. Care of the injured in LMICs. And this is a snapshot of our small foundation. We started off in 2015. We have a budget of about 8.3 million Swiss francs, which is about the same thing in US dollars these days. And we have a footprint in about 36 sub-Saharan countries and Asian countries as well. Over the course of the next 20 minutes, that's what the clock says, I'll be speaking on four themes. I want to talk to you about the epidemic of injuries in low and middle income countries. I also want to show, share with you some trends in trauma and orthopedics, especially in Africa. 
I want to pick one of our countries where we have a larger program, and that's Ethiopia, to highlight what is being there, done there by AO Alliance, but also with others. And then the do's and the don'ts. It's not academic, it's not professional. I was introduced as a world-renowned orthopedic surgeon. Well, I'm not very academic. The only thing I had growing up as a resident, I had a great pair of hands, that I had. But I wasn't very much academic. Who knows someone who's died in a car accident in the last five years in the audience? Not, not a patient, but a friend. Lift your hands up. Who knows someone who's been left with some type of a bad disability in the last five years? How about a child involved in a car accident or a pedestrian accident in the last five years? Who wore their seatbelt on the way to the lecture this morning? Good. Let's look at the numbers. You all know about HIV, AIDS, malaria, and TB. But injuries and violence, of which road traffic accidents are part of, kill worldwide about 4.6 million people. And that's about a third more than the big three communicable diseases. Now, if we drill down on those numbers a little bit more, we know that 90% of those deaths occur in low-income countries, and 40% involve the young productive age range between the ages of 18 to 25. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Because some estimates say that for every death as a result of injury and violence, between 10 and 50 people remain with some type of a disability. Now, it may not be a permanent disability, but let's take the number 10 as a relatively conservative estimate, that means 41 million people worldwide on a yearly basis develop or are left with some type of a disability. And we know that 75% of them involve the musculoskeletal system, going back to the title of my talk. So a rough estimate is about 34 million people worldwide on a yearly basis in low and in middle income countries have some type of a musculoskeletal disability. That's the problem. Most people don't know about this problem. When I speak to audiences who are not in the medical field, you may know it because you're involved in it. But people that are not involved in the medical or surgical field don't know about this problem. Let's look at some trends, especially in Africa. Well, the world population is increasing. We know that. But the population in Africa is also increasing. With a fertility rate of about four, you can't, you can't avoid it. Europe's flat, going down a little bit. So from 2010 to 2020, the, uh, the African population increased by about 29%, 30%. And for the next 10 years, we're looking at an increase of about 26%. The surgical workforce. So this is a map of Africa. Anything that's bright green is great. And the only country that's bright green is Egypt. So based on the Lancet Global Health Report, we're looking at having at least 20 surgeons, anesthesiologists and obstetrics, gynecologists, per 100,000 population. Ethiopia has about 66. TNO surgeons for a population of roughly just over 100 million. Canada, which is a country I know quite well, has a, about 1,500 orthopedic and trauma surgeons for a population of just over 36 million. This means that people will seek alternative care that's affordable and available, and they seek the care of traditional bone setters. We had this in Canada, in Quebec, when I was growing up. We called them the charlatans, charlatans. This is a picture of a two-year-old child that was playing with some siblings that broke their femur, that were treated at home by traditional bone setters with tight dressings, the herbs, and the creams. Showed up at the emergency room of one of my good friends in Kumasi just recently, and now they're just wait they were just waiting for the demarcation to figure out what level they're going to be doing the amputation at. The, 
diagnostic priorities are changing and evolving. 10 years ago, a lot of it was around club feet. Relatively simple diagnosis to be able to do missions and to help out. Ponsetti methods, relatively simple and effective to treat. But injuries are going up, 2020, and the injuries will continue to go up. But Sub-Saharan Africa is being hit with what I call the double whammy. The communicable diseases will always be there. But the non-communicable diseases, of which injuries is buried into, are also going up. So diabetes, ischemic heart disease, tumors, cancers, and arthritis are also there. I show this slide to show that COSEXA has been involved, if I remember well, since 1999. AOSEC Social Economic Committee with the AO Foundation was also involved in 2010. Now AO Alliance is involved and COSEXA is very much more involved in 2020. There is no French equivalent. And for Western Africa, the West African College of Surgeons is also involved. Now hopefully there'll be a French equivalent in 2030. The picture on the right-hand side is the trauma and orthopedic staff at the Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Blantyre. I've been fortunate enough to see these four young people graduate from their residency, pass their COSEXA fellowship exams, and now they are the future of this particular trauma and orthopedic service at really the, one of the three central hospitals in Malawi. This is one of my favorite slides. Americans and Swiss patients are hypochondriacs. They're spending pretty close to 10,000 US dollars on a yearly basis for their health care. Canadians and Irish patients are a little bit more reasonable. You're spending about half of the amount of money on your health care. The orange country are the Cosexa countries that have isolated. The number one is Zimbabwe that's spending $94 per capita on health care. I want you to remember the number of Ethiopia, okay, $28. And if you look at the top line, how much money will be put in as projected by 2030, it's not sustainable. There's no way by putting in this amount of money that you can help your people with regards to improving their health care. Let's look at Ethiopia, what AO Alliance and others are doing in Ethiopia right now. This is a little bit of our footprint. In Africa, French don't speak English, English don't speak French, so I have to, I'm fortunate enough that I speak both languages, although some people say that my French is not real French. It's French Quebecois. It's a little bit more difficult to understand. But we have four favorite children, I'll call them, four countries in Sub-Saharan Africa where we have greater activities. Ethiopia is one of them. Our competency is really in the capacity building and the education of frontline healthcare workers involved in fracture care and care of the injured. And we do this through face-to-face -face education, fellowships, reverse fellowships, some clinical research opportunities as well as setting up trauma registries. And last but not least is a little bit of infrastructure development, although it's not one of our competencies. Ethiopia started off as really a meeting an Australian surgeon involved with a group called the Australian Doctors for Africa at a meeting in Melbourne in 2014. And he says, Claude, he says, you got to come to Ethiopia. We, we've been putting on this course where we bring our own bones and drills and things like that. But we're, it's getting beyond our capacity because the residency programs are growing. We know that you have some bigger means. Maybe we can do something together. Remember the circle around this particular region, because I'll come back to it in a few slides. So we started off in Addis Ababa in 2015. In 2016, we ran the first combined pre-basic course. And that's a picture of the group the, uh, that took the course above. All first-year residents in trauma and orthopedic surgery. 
We're following the national strategic plan of developing regional reference centers outside of Addis. Ethiopia is the second most populous country in, sub in Sub-Saharan Africa. Roughly, let's say 100 million people after Nigeria. The only city that has more than a million people is Addis at about 4, 4.5 million people depending on which statistics you believe. So 2016, we went to Hawassa and are working there. 2017, we ended up in Bahir Dar and are working with the university. 2018 was Harar, which has a catchment area of about 30 million people. Then we went to Gondar in 2019. Now, every first year resident in trauma or orthopedics has access to an operative fracture care management course. All of the senior residents taking the COSEXA fellowship exam are passing. All the residents have access to pediatric rotations with the collaboration of Cure Ethiopia. Henry Wynne Jones and Tony Clayson in the UK out of the Rivington are going back about four or five times a year to teach and educate in Hawassa. And we've developed partnerships with all of these people in Ethiopia. So you can't do it alone. Let's look at Hosiana, which is what we're looking at now in 2020. This was our visit with Jim Harrison, is, is a UK-based surgeon who built essentially the uh, Cure Hospital in Malawi. We regularly go on a scouting mission to add a regional reference center. Last year, we visited Hosiana. Now, Hosiana is in that circle that I showed you. It has a catch in the area of 20% of the population of Ethiopia. To keep it simple, I said it's 100 million. So if you do the math, that's a catchment area of 20 million people, of which 80% is rural, is one trauma and orthopedic surgeon. The x-ray machine's not working. It's a fancy pack system that is always broken. There's only one ward, 30 patients, only one theater, clean and dirty. The picture on the top is the surgical scrub sink. And the picture at the bottom is, for me, was an eye opener. Homemade vac dressing that is probably one of the nicest dressings I've seen in a long time, even from a high income country, hooked up to a wall suction machine. So there is a way. But this is the future. These are all young national Ethiopian trauma and orthopedic surgeons at various hospitals. Eight of them out of the 66 that I mentioned. And I've watched these people grow over the last five years. And I've watched their ingenuity for their people. We're going to wrap it up very shortly. But as I said, the do's and don'ts. They're based out of really 10 years of traveling the world, looking people in the whites of their eyes, interacting with them. And it's by no means scientific. It doesn't have a P factor. And it's just personal experiences of some messages that I want to leave you with. I've been fortunate enough to make a lot of friends. And I've been fortunate enough to develop a lot of partnerships with professional organizations, licensing bodies, governments, ministers of health, as well as other NGOs. The problem is you got to make sure that people are aligned so that you're not duplicating. And you also want to make sure that you're not working in silos. <coughs> you need to go back often. You know, these video conferences don't work. This coronavirus issue is, is putting a lot of damper on some of our efforts, just as I'm sure it's putting some damper on your efforts as well. Ask questions. But remember your oath of first do no harm. And that means everywhere, first do no harm. Last but not least is be culturally sensitive. By that I mean you need to have Africans take care of African problems. As the famous song says, with a little bit of help from your friends. The don'ts. Well, judge. Picture on the top. You say, oh my god, 
but it's actually a very well functioning plaster room. The equipment's there, everything's there. It's just a little disorderly, but it works. It works in that environment. Don't hold the knife, hold the retractors. I think you exactly know what I mean by that. I take this opportunity for the third bullet point. You shouldn't be supplying what is the responsibility of the government and the hospitals. And, and I take this opportunity to call upon the industry to solve this problem for affordable implants for LMICs. Antiretroviral therapy was made available and became affordable because it was, a, it was made out to be a real public health issue. And I think that the silence and neglected epidemic of injuries in LMICs is the same thing. And that's the only way we're going to get to the bottom of this. But we need help from the industry somehow. So that's my plug to, to really get the industry involved. Last but not least, do not get involved in surgical safaris. You know what they are. To me, surgical safaris equal complications left behind. So just think of someone performing a total hip replacement in an LMIC that gets infected. There's no antibiotics. There's no one to take out the prosthesis. So we have to think about the consequences of our actions in certain countries. My take home messages and what I hope you'll remember from this presentation. As I showed you in the first part, it's one of the leading causes of death and disability worldwide, especially in the people under 60 years of age. I'm gonna be turning 60 this year, so that's very, very much hits me home. Remember the tip of the iceberg. I showed you that for every death, there's between 10 and 50 people that have some type of a disability, and 75% of them involve the musculoskeletal system. Extremity injuries, just think open tibias, femoral shaft fractures, treated in traction, morbidity, and significant disability. Last but not least, some countries are actually waking up and they're actually doing things. I showed you the example of Ethiopia. I could tell you about Malawi. I could tell you about Ghana. I could talk, tell you about the Gambia. I could also tell you about some countries in Asia, Myanmar, for instance, as well as Nepal. But some countries are waking up. But you have to have leadership locally to let them solve their own problems, and as I said, with a little bit of help from their friends. Back to the story. You want to know how it ended up. Was it luck or was it skill? Well, the orthopedic surgeon at the university hospital had been well trained and had been trained to provide timely and appropriate care with the resources available and he remembered this training. This paper is actually from the UK. Some of you may know uh, Jonathan Dwyer uh, from the UK. This still works quite well, and maybe you don't need uh, K-wire fixation because it requires a C-arm. Thank you. <laughs>